Do you need prayer for someone? Or do you want to share an answered prayer? You can do this by filling in the praise and prayer report card that can be found in the seats in front of you. When you have finished filling in the praise and prayer report, you can simply give it in at the info desk. Connect groups are an opportunity for you to connect with others around you and grow together in your relationship with Christ. Find one for you and join a connect group today. Volunteers Training presented by Pam Funnycake. This will be presented on the 11th of June, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Connections Church. Refreshments and lunch will be served. Please register on www.connectionschurch.co.za before the 3rd of June. At Kids Connect, we give a Bible to every primary school child who visits us. It's a wonderful way of sharing the Word of God with a large number of families. Please consider making a donation to our Buy a Bible campaign. Visit our table on Sunday the 12th of June. Bibles cost 80 Rand each. of June at 8.30 a.m. and 10 a.m., Connections Church will be having a youth blessing service. If you want more information, please contact Hayden at connectionschurch.co.za. On the 18th of June at 10 a.m., we'll be doing repairs to the fence at the plot. If you can help, please come through. We need all hands on deck. Are you good? I'm, I'm excited. My wife came home. She wasn't a suitor for five days. That's why I lost weight. No, I didn't. I didn't. I actually, myself and my daughter ate out most nights. And, uh, you know, I just, I want to I wanna make something clear, all right, on Facebook. You know, people, people take me seriously. And I, I, I stated on Facebook that I was excited that my wife was coming back because she could cook. And then I continued and I followed up by saying she can also do DIY and massage me and spoil us. And everyone takes me seriously. And you should, because that's exactly <laughs> why I was excited that she came back. And the fact that I love her and married her and she, we, have, we have children together, all right? So just to ease everyone's hearts. I love my wife. She's more than just a DIY person. So much, so much more. She irons. <laughs> Fantastic. So this morning I'm going to start on a, uh, a theme for the month, which is 
the theme called change, and it's really about Pentecost. Pentecost is the birth of the church. In fact, we start celebrating today. Today is a celebration of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. Um, he sent the Holy Spirit as he had promised in the scripture. The Holy Spirit came to earth, filled every believer that was in the upper room, and their life was empowered to live the life that God had saved them to live. Amen. Amen. And so that's really what we're going to be doing today. The fact is this, we see in the Bible a group of, of, of really, un, you know, insignificant, weak, powerless people who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then they began to live their lives in an extraordinary way. Amen? And that's really what we'll be focusing on today. The word um, changed that we're focusing on for the theme, it means this, to, to make different, to alter, or to modify. And my prayer this morning is that every single person that's here who knows Jesus, who has been through the waters of baptism, now comes to the point where either they are baptized in the Holy Spirit or they need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm trusting that every person that isn't baptized in the Holy Spirit would leave having received the power of God's Spirit in their lives, which enables them to live life the way that God intended for them to live. Amen? Empowered. Amen. I want to, I want to make it a, a statement, and it might be controversial, all right? Yes, let me make it anyway. The Holy Spirit wasn't sent so that we can look stupid. <laughs> it wasn't sent so that we can bark like dogs. It wasn't sent so that we can shake on the floor. It wasn't sent so that we can do silly things. The Holy Spirit was sent to empower us to do something. Amen? Amen. People seem to want to run after the spectacular, the weird. Uh, we don't believe in the weird. If Jesus did it, I will do it. If he didn't do it, I'm not going to do it. Amen? And so that's what we want this morning. We want the Holy Spirit. We want to be walking our lives full of that Holy Spirit that changes us, empowers us, and makes us able to live this extraordinary life that God saved us for. You with me this morning? So I really do pray that every single person that has not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit is filled today to live that life that is extraordinary. Myself and Nadia uh, moved from Cape Town to uh, Mossel Bay in 2002. And I remember when we moved, my son, Zachary, was two months old. All right? Now, listen, a geographic move is a challenge. We were married for about a year and a half, two years. That's a challenge. And then we are going to a new town, which is a challenge. Now we had a child that was two months old, which was a challenge. And another challenge on top of all those other challenges is the fact that Zachary had croup. And he was constantly in hospital, struggled to breathe, really suffered, really went through incredible difficult moments um, that he spent in hospital. So for the first two years of his life, he spent literally weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks in hospital. And... We were blessed because Nadia, after the first year, actually got a job at the hospital, baby hospital, and she would work in the children's ward. So at night, she would literally put on her civvies, she would sleep in the ward with him, and then the next morning, she would wake up and work in the children's ward. And I remember one night, Zachary was so ill, he was really struggling to breathe. You could see this kid was suffering, right? You could see that things weren't the way they were supposed to be. And so we took him into hospital, and he went in for the night. And I remember going to visit him the next day after work. I went to, to the hospital, and I walked into the children's ward. And what I saw was different to what I'd seen the night before. Zachary, my son, who was suffering and struggling to breathe, who was coughing uncontrollably, had changed. <laughs> How did he change? Well, I walk into the ward and he's literally bouncing off the walls. He's jumping on furniture. He's now Superman. He is now flying everywhere. He's just doing things crazily. His heart rate is 300 beats a minute. He's freaking out his mother. He's freaking out the nurses. He's freaking out the other kids. And he is just going wild. Zachary had changed overnight. And I'm thinking, what brought about the change from him, him suffering and struggling to breathe to now suddenly bouncing around, so energetic, full of life? And it's simple. They gave him inhalation steroids. 
So the steroids cause the swelling in the lungs to come down. But on top of that, it energizes you a little bit. So his heart rate was up and he was super energetic. And, and I started thinking about how that inhalation, how breathing in that steroids changed him in a few moments. And how the Holy Spirit, when we receive him, when we breathe in of this incredible God called the Holy Spirit, how it changes us in an instant. Amen. And how the church is so dependent on the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, I'm not sure, maybe you have experienced that kind of thing in your life. Now, I'm, I'm going to be speaking to all those who have a history, who have a past, all right? You might know of a time where you went to a certain place where they serve demonic liquid, <laughs> also known as alcohol. And people are going, not us, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> And the others are all sort of sinking into their seats, hiding their eyes. We, we've all, many of us have been there. I understand what the term blind drunk means. I've experienced that once in my life. God forbid anyone gets blind drunk. But you know how you, you, you drink a drink and then you change? You know what I'm talking about? Suddenly you become bold. You know, you're an introvert, but now you're an extrovert. You don't care who sees you or who hears you. You can run around in your jocks and everyone's like, he's crazy. And you're going, I'm free. <laughs> you change in an instant. Or maybe put yourself into this situation. Maybe you've done this or you've seen your children do this. You're walking around a building site and out of the wall sticks a little wire. And I've, as, as most adults and definitely most children are, we always want to know, what does that little wire do? So we touch the little wire. Next thing, we didn't break dancing, you know. <laughs> we, we, we have an encounter with what came out of that wire. It's called power, electricity, right? It instantly changes us. It changes what we say. <laughs> you know what I mean? When, when we get shocked, we don't go, bless God. <laughs> it changes how we look. Fizzy hair. It changes how we think for a second. Don't touch that wire again. We're changed in an instant because we had an encounter with power. You see, when we have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, something changes in us. So we need to understand that the one constant in life is change. We're always changing. God wants to continually change us, but we have to yield to him to do so, amen, and we have to invite change, in other words, you might be here today, you might not have received Jesus, you'll have an opportunity at the end of this meeting to receive Jesus, you might not have been baptized, next week you'll have the opportunity to be baptized, you might be here and you have not been filled with the Holy Spirit today, after the service, we are going to pray that God fills you with his glorious Holy Spirit and his power that will enable you to live life, and let me tell you, it will change you in an instant, you with me, amen, God is good. As Christ followers, we are constantly being changed. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed. The word there is metamorphia, which means to be changed from one state into another state. Let me ask you a question. Who of you has seen a flying worm? All right, amen. Worms don't fly. Worms don't fly. But when they have gone through the metamorphosis process, when they have changed, when they have gone into the cocoon, when they come out, when they have been transformed, they have wings, they become beautiful butterflies. I'm a beautiful butterfly. Remember that movie, Bugs Life? Once it has wings, it can fly. You see, once you go through the change, God enables you to fly in the things of the spirits. He enables you to fly in the things of life. He enables you to ascend. You with me? So this morning, I want you to take a journey with me as we follow the exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt and how that brought about change in the nation and how it relates to us today. There is a parallel between the story of the Israelites leaving Egypt and the believer's process to living an extraordinary life. I want to speak about today three steps every believer must make or must take in order to live an extraordinary life. You with me on the journey this morning? 
Step number one, follow the king. Follow the king. The Israelites were born in captivity. Amen. They were born into slavery. In Exodus 1 verse 8, it says this, Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to the people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor and they built um, Fithim and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Amen? Now here's the thing is, just like they were born into captivity, Egypt is symbolic or representative of sin, so too we were born into sin. We were born into captivity. Amen? In Romans 5 verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in the same way death came to all people because all sinned. Let me explain this. Our great, 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 great grandfather, Adam, was to blame for sin entering the world. Amen? And let me tell you this, if you think you are righteous enough, if you were Adam, you would have done exactly the same thing. Amen? We were born into sin. We are slaves to sin. But when we are in bondage, while we were in bondage, while the Egyptians kept the Israelites in bondage, an incredible leader, a redeemer, a deliverer was born to Israel. And his name was Moses. Amen. Can I have that scripture, please? Next scripture. Is it not working? There we go. It says, now go and I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God sends Jesus. Oh, so God sends Moses to the Israelites to bring the people out of Egypt. And just like the Egyptians were in bondage, we are born into bondage of sin. God sends us a mighty deliverer and his name is Jesus. Amen. Can I have the scripture, please? It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Isn't it incredible that we have a mighty deliverer that was sent to set us free? Amen. But we have to follow him. We have to walk after Jesus. We have to follow him. Amen. Give me one second, please. If you would stand with me this morning as we pray, I want to pray about something. I do believe that there are people here, and we'll sit down in a moment, that are concerned. People that are nervous, people that have come from maybe more conservative churches, people that have come from more mainline traditional churches. And I want you to know something this morning. The Holy Spirit is not a boogeyman. Amen. He's a gentleman. The Holy Spirit will never force you to do anything. The Holy Spirit will never make you do anything weird or stupid. The Holy Spirit was sent to empower us. And I really just feel like God wants me to pray just for the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit to rest on the people of God, to rest on everyone here. I'm going to ask you just to lift your hands as a sign of surrender. I'm going to pray. Holy Spirit, would you come this morning? God, the Holy Spirit, would you come this morning? Would you make your presence felt? May your people who are here present know your closeness. We thank you that you were sent, Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, that you came powerfully to the earth to empower us to live the life that Father has saved us 
to live. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal yourself to your people this morning, that they would become acquainted with your presence, that they would know your closeness. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't ever be deceived to think that this is something weird, but something genuinely powerful, something beautiful, something life changing. Spirit of the living God, breathe upon the people of God this morning. May they know your closeness, Father. Energize your people. May they know and be aware that you are here with us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may take your seats. Our first encounter on the journey of living an extraordinary life is to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, to follow our King, amen, who will set us free from bondage of sin. The second step we must take is this. We have to drown sin and the past. The Israelites came out of Egypt were pursued by the Egyptian enemy. Understand, Egypt symbolizes the sin Egypt symbolizes bondage, right? God brings his people out of Egypt and even though they come out of Egypt, Egypt still pursues them. Exodus 14 verse nine says, then the Egyptians pursued them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army and they overtook them camping by the sea besides Paharoth in front of Baal Zephon. Even though they had been set free the Egyptians still pursue them, even though they had left bondage, bondage is trying to pursue them. Amen. We receive Jesus, but we are still pursued by sin. In Colossians 2 verse 12, it says, having been buried, the sin nature put to death with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Let me explain to you. When I first got saved, I thought I was going to be perfect from that day forward. I thought my sins are forgiven. I'm the righteousness of, of God in Christ Jesus. Everything's gonna be fantastic. And I realized moments later that I was still wanting to sin. You know why? Because sin pursues you regardless. Amen. Only when I went through the waters of baptism did I discover that the power of sin had been cut off. Something supernatural happened when I was baptized. Amen. Amen. Many young believers think that when they begin to follow Jesus, that sin won't have any power over them. But let me tell you, it pursues you. Anyone else agree? Yeah. You've come to Jesus, you think this is fantastic, I'm gonna serve him. You look back and sin's crouching at the door and it wants you. The enemy doesn't want you to make the promised land. The enemy wants to make sure that you are destroyed before you become more and more like Jesus. Amen? See what happens to the Israelites and how it happens with the believers too. The Israelites went through the Red Sea. The Egyptians pursued them, but God tells Moses to drown what kept them in bondage. So they've come out of Egypt. They followed their king, their leader, the redeemer, right? The one who would rescue them, the one who would set them free from bondage. Sin pursues them. They get to the Red Sea and now they're going to go through the waters of the Red Sea. And God says this to them. Exodus 14 verse 26. Then, Moses, uh, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and, the, and at daybreak the sea went back into its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. Amen. You see, your sin might pursue you, but when you go through the waters, when you go through that baptism, what happens is the power of sin is cut off. Amen. In Romans 6 verse 4, believers also come out of Egypt. They follow Jesus. Then they have to go through the waters of baptism. We were buried therefore with him in baptism 
by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Amen? You see, baptism isn't simply an outward reflection of an inward change. It's a supernatural event that cuts off the power and the influence of sin in your life. It's when you're baptized, things die. Amen. And I want to touch on something that is so sensitive and often heard in our church. So often people come to Jesus, they follow their king, but when it comes to baptism, they say, I'm not ready. Right? (laughs) I'm, I'm not ready. Ready for what? I'm not ready to be baptized. I have to sort myself out. I have to get my life right. No, 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 that's not how it works. This gets your life right. This sorts you out. Amen. Listen to it says in Acts 22 verse 16. It says, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. What are you waiting for? I'm waiting to... Become right with God. You are right with God. Jesus made you right with God. Well, I want to be more clean. No, this enables you to live a life that is clean. Amen? Come on, church. You know, what's amazing is you find a story in the Bible where uh, the man of God is ministering to a centurion, a jailer, in fact. And the jailer comes to Christ. He's converted. He receives Jesus. And then the man of God says to him, listen, look, you've just made this decision, him and his whole household. And he says, look, there's some water. Doesn't say where the water was. Just there's water. It might have been a pothole, (laughs) a Benoni pothole filled with green, oily, stinky water, right? Right? He didn't tell him, put on a white shirt and shorts. Wait, wait, wait. We're going to get the geezer to warm up the pothole. He just said, there's water. Now we want to immediately, after you've received Jesus, we are going to cut off the power of sin in your life. Because when you go under that water, death is going to come to sin. And you're going to come out in the resurrection power of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you, church, next week, we're having a baptismal service here at the church. If you have not been baptized, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. You can't wait until you're right. You get baptized to get right so that you can live the way that God wants you to live. Amen. Amen. God wants you to live an extraordinary life. Get baptized next Sunday. Amen. So that's the second step. The third step is this, we have to breathe in the extraordinary God. Amen. In Exodus 33 verse 11, Moses says to God, he says, you have brought us out of Egypt. In other words, we have followed, people have followed me. You have brought us out of Egypt. We have come to know Jesus. You have taken us through the waters. We've been baptized. But but God, I cannot get to the promised land without your presence. I cannot get to the promised land without your ability. I cannot get to the promised land without your power. And it says in Exodus 33 verse 14, he says, and he said, I myself will go with you and give you rest. This is God speaking to Moses. And Moses said, if you yourself are not going with us, do not send us on from here. See, Moses understood he had no power and the people had no power or ability to get to the promised land. They needed the power of God to work in their situation. They needed God's closeness. Amen. As believers, for those of us who have received Jesus, who have already followed the King, for those of us who have gone through the Red Sea, who have gone through the waters of baptism, and we have cut off the sin, power of sin over us. We come to this next phase in our lives where we are living in this world and we are, we are aiming for eternity. Amen? 
How arrogant is it of us to think that we can do it in our own strength or our own ability? Amen? We need the power of the Holy Spirit, just like Moses did and just like the early church did. You with me? See, Jesus was on earth. He was God in the flesh. And he said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send you another one who is exactly like me, the Holy Spirit, the helper. And he will lead you into all truth. And we read in Luke 24, verse 49, it says, Jesus speaking, he says, I'm going to send you what the Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Man, what a powerful scripture. Amen. Listen, God's not, listen, I'm going to give you a scarf. I'm not going to give you a hat. He says, I'm going to clothe you. You are going to be completely covered in my power. You are going to be full of my power. Don't leave the city. Wait until you receive power because there's nothing you can do until you have received my power. So why do we as believers think that we can go out every single day without the power of God and accomplish anything of significance or live a life that is extraordinary? Amen. See, and the disciples waited, just like Jesus told them to, until the promise was fulfilled. And we read that in Acts 2 verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Amen. Now I want you to think for a moment and look at what the Bible says. They were told to wait until they were clothed with power. What is the outcome? What is the outworking? What is the manifestation from being filled with the Spirit? We read that in Acts 2 verse 11. People that watched what was going on, people that saw what they had experienced had this to say, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in, their own, in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Amen.